Welcome back to our Wednesday afternoon Bible study. This is session 21. We will be finishing up Luke chapter 10. Uh, thank you for tuning us in. Readings are the World English Bible, public domain, and the Bible reader is Andrew Coleman from LibriVox.org, also public domain. Uh, please uh, get your own Bibles ready. And also, if you can find somebody to do the discussion questions with, you will probably get more out of this study. The questions are worth discussing. So uh, let us begin with a word of prayer. O oh God, we know that you have revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ, and you continue to speak to us through your scriptures, through our fellowship, and through your spirit who dwells in us. Speak to us today. Give us a mind of honest inquiry as we read and reflect upon the Gospel of Luke. In exploring this Gospel, may we come to know you better, and may we gain insight into our own lives and situation. Amen. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and reveal them to little children. Yes, Father, for so it was well-pleasing in your sight. Seems to me that this is one of the strangest prayers uttered by Jesus. It's a prayer of thanksgiving that important truths have been hidden from the wise and revealed to little children, or people of low esteem. The words seem to be directed more to the audience than to God, and if taken face value, they express Jesus' gratitude that God has hidden his truth from some people. This is a case where Jesus should probably be heard as speaking with a strong sense of irony or even sarcasm. After all, the point of the prayer is that the wise aren't so wise, and the ignorant children aren't as foolish as some people may think. That uh, that implication is blatantly ironic. Still, if you're in the business of revealing God's truth to people, as Jesus was, then how can you be happy that truth has been hidden from some? You may remember a similar issue arising earlier during the discussion of the parable of the sower, when Jesus says to his disciples, uh, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive and listening they may not understand. Luke 8, 10. Was Jesus really glad that some people didn't understand? Well, maybe at a superficial level. When watching people argue, you may be glad to see the little guy best the expert, but that doesn't mean that ultimately you wouldn't want everyone to come to the truth. We should remember also that Jesus has described the work of God's kingdom as a lamp on a stand illuminating everything in a house, and he warned, pay attention to how you listen for those who have more will be given, and those who do not have even what they seem to have will be taken away, Luke 8, 18. So if the wise are really ignorant, it's only because they aren't listening for the truth. God hides truth from those who refuse to look for it. Why would it be pleasing to God to hide the truth from some people and reveal it to others? Why would Jesus be grateful God did this? Was this prayer spoken with irony or was Jesus genuinely pleased by the ignorance of some? Do you know of some examples where the wise turned out to be wrong and the little children turned out to be right? Did that turn of affairs give you a sense of satisfaction? Is this prayer of Jesus another example of him rooting for the underdogs? Have you ever found yourself holding a minority opinion in the face of wise people who told you otherwise? How do you handle it? How can we find the courage to resist the crowd or the experts when we think the crowd is wrong? Are there examples of the experts actually being right and the minority opinions being wrong? Are there times when the wise are truly wise? How can we know when to listen to the experts and ignore the dissenters?
Turning to the disciples, he said, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and he to whomever the Son desires to reveal him. What does it mean to know who the Son is? And what does it mean to know who the Father is? We tend to see knowing God as a matter of facts and information, but in the Bible it's really about a personal first-hand relationship. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, Genesis 4.1, a King James Bible. The knowledge Adam had of Eve wasn't intellectual in nature, so when Jesus speaks of the Son knowing the Father and the Father knowing the Son, he's suggesting that there's a relationship between him and God that is unique and ideal. Initially, we don't fully know who God is, but Jesus does. And Jesus serves as a conduit so we can know who God is as well. And we don't fully know who Jesus is, but God does. This last statement throws an element of doubt into our understanding of Jesus. If only God knows who Jesus is, then uh, we can't ourselves fully know him. So people who pretend to have Jesus all figured out, well, they're really fooling themselves. Still, this Jesus, who we don't fully understand, connects us to a God who we can fully relate to, thanks to Jesus. Questions. What do you think Jesus means by, All things have been delivered to me by my Father. If all things have been delivered to Jesus, why is there still evil in the world? How has Jesus enabled you to relate more fully to God? What does it mean for you to know God? Is there a difference between knowing God and understanding God? Can you do one without the other? Is it still true that no one knows who the Son is except the Father? Should we qualify our doctrines about Jesus with a dose of doubt? Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see the things which you see and didn't see them, and to hear the things which you hear, and didn't hear them. There's a tendency to glorify the past and dismiss the present. Uh, things were better in the olden days, right? But Jesus is, in a sense, idealizing his present. The things happening right then as he spoke were things the past folk looked forward to. Sometimes the present is better than we realize. Questions. In what ways was the present reality of Jesus better than his past reality? Specifically, what are the things the apostles saw that the prophets and kings longed to see? What things in our present world are better than our past? What are the things happening today that people of the past desired to see? Do you agree with the observation that people tend to devalue the present and overvalue the past? Why or why not? Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Lawyers, also called in the Bible scribes, uh, were a literate class of teachers who copied and expounded the Jewish scripture, especially the Torah, or the law. Uh, they are frequently criticized by Jesus, but this one 
the scribe is affirmed by Jesus for his understanding of eternal life. Whereas many Christians dismiss the Jewish law as irrelevant, the lawyer is able with the encouragement of Jesus to find the key to eternal life in its commandments. Eternal life is all about loving God and others, according to the scribe. At this point, it might be good to remember the Gospel of John's view of eternal life. John sees eternal life as something we have now. See John 6:47, for example. While in Luke and Matthew and Mark, it is something we inherit in the future. There are also some different angles as to how to receive it. In John's Gospel, eternal life comes through believing in Jesus. In this passage here in Luke, eternal life comes through loving God and loving others. Questions. How do you understand eternal life? Do you think of it as living forever or as a quality of life one enjoys here and now and always? Do you expect to inherit eternal life or is it all ready yours. If eternal life comes through love, is it possible to love and not believe in Jesus? Would such a person have eternal life? Is it possible to believe in Jesus and not love? Would such a person have eternal life? Scribes or lawyers often gave Jesus a hard time, but this one had some valuable insights to share. Have you ever received valuable insights from troublesome people? What can Christianity learn from its critics? But he, desiring to justify himself, asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who both stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. By chance, a certain priest was going down that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he travelled, came where he was. When he saw him, he was moved with compassion, came to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the host, and said to him, Take care of him. Whatever you spend beyond that, I will repay you when I return. Now, which of these three do you think seemed to be a neighbor to him who fell among the robbers? He said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The story of the Good Samaritan is one of the most popular and well-known stories in the Bible. Muggers beat up, rob, and leave a certain man to die. A priest, and that's someone who works in the temple in Jerusalem and is supposed to connect people to God by making offerings and sacrifices on their behalf. A priest and a Levite, who is someone who also works in the temple, in Jerusalem, assisting the priests by keeping the temple running, uh, do nothing to solve the problem of the injured man on the road. Uh, well, here's the thing, touching a dead body makes you unclean and therefore unfit for their divine duties. And if they're heading toward Jerusalem going to work, this might be a problem. So they fail at the task of helping the injured and possibly dying or dead person. A Samaritan rises to the occasion, however, and he ends up being the hero of the story. The story is not, uh, it's a not so subtle critique of the Jerusalem temple and those running it. In a wider sense, it may be a criticism of organized religion that makes people holy without making them compassionate. 
Jesus tells the story to answer the question, who is my neighbor? And he ultimately answers this question with his own question. Which of these three seemed to be a neighbor? Uh, the one who showed mercy was the answer. And Jesus would reply, go and do likewise is his final word on the subject. You could miss the point by seeing this exchange as uh, who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is the one who shows mercy, therefore we should love people who show us mercy. But Jesus shifts the discussion away from the first question, who is my neighbor, to a more personal question of who am I a neighbor to? And like the Good Samaritan, he suggests that we should be neighbors to those who are hurting, even if they're people who make us uncomfortable or might even make us unclean. If you're a neighbor to everyone, like the Samaritan is, then everyone becomes your neighbor. Questions. Have you ever been a good Samaritan? Has a good Samaritan ever come to your aid? Uh, share some examples. How can organized religious bodies guard against the danger of making people holy without making them compassionate. Have you ever seen Christians turn their backs on someone hurting? Have you ever seen non-Christians help out where Christians walked on by? If we stop to, to help everyone we encounter who's in need, there's a danger that we would never get anything done. How does one strike a, pop, a proper balance between compassion and the responsibilities of work and family. Should the priest and Levite in the story have been willing to sacrifice their biblical divine job responsibilities for the sake of one injured person? It happened as they went on their way, he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she came up to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister left me to serve alone? Ask her therefore to help me. Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good part which will not be taken away from her. As we have seen, of all the Gospels, Luke has the highest esteem for women and their role in ministry. And this story is another example of that. None of the other Gospels report this incident where Mary is criticized by her sister Martha for sitting at the feet of Jesus instead of helping her in the kitchen, helping her serve. Disciples sat at the feet of their masters to learn from that master. So when Jesus defended Mary sitting at his feet, he was taking a stand in favor of the education and training of women. This was not a common attitude in the first century Jewish world. Jesus answers Martha with two basic observations. First, Martha is worried about and distracted by too many things. She should relax because there's only one thing that is needed. Only one thing she should be concerned about. Second, Mary is concerned with the right thing and Jesus isn't about to take it away from her. While Jesus never defines the one thing that is needed, it's implied that Mary is focusing on it while Martha is getting sidetracked. And whatever the right thing is for Mary, it is seen in her being with and learning from Jesus. Questions. What is the one thing that Martha is failing to focus on? Is that the better part that Mary has embraced? Are you more of a Martha or a Mary? Are you focused on the important thing or distracted by many unimportant things? What are the unimportant things distracting and worrying you the most? What is your one important thing? Is it unfair for Mary to leave Martha stuck with the work of serving? 
How would you feel if you were Martha? Are there Marthas in your life who worked so you would have uh, the time to be a Mary? Have you ever been a Martha so someone else could be a Mary? Well, that concludes our Bible study for today. Thank you for tuning us in. Let's go ahead and end with a word of prayer. God, we are grateful that we continue to gain insight and knowledge through the scriptures. After all of these years, you still speak to us. May we listen to your voice and may we follow it in the weeks and days to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.